turn to Luke chapter 10. We had a really wonderful time in the adult Sunday school class this morning talking about uh, letting our hearts be filled up with praise for God. It's a good reminder, you know, these Sunday school classes, the book we read in there, because uh, our prayers can start to look the same all the time. Lord, help me with this, help me with that. Lord, I'm in trouble here, I'm in trouble there. And... Uh, it's good to remember, Lord, you are high, you are exalted, and I'm down here. And Lord, I give you my everything, because you're worthy of my everything. Uh, how would your, how would you and I, how would we wake up differently in the morning if our first thought was, God is wonderful? How would we approach work school, household chores, relationships, if we're always filled up with the goodness of God, does that change anything? I, I'm, I know it does. I want to dwell in that place. I'm sick of wallowing in self-pity and anger or bitterness or whatever else we can wallow in. I want to wallow in God's goodness like a fat old happy pig. Slop and grace all around. Today's topic is salvation, and uh, I want to give what is those called a disclaimer? Uh, there's there's several ways that really, really wise, intelligent people have spoken about salvation before, and uh, you've got your Moody Bible Institute, Dallas Theo, Dispensationalist. Then you have your, your covenant theology. And uh, somebody who's not very bright, they end up looking a lot more similar than they think. They think they're at odds. But I'm going to set that all aside because, uh, and I, I may be wrong to do this. Uh, I've tried to take a simpler approach of reading the scripture, and I've tried to do this maybe the last 15 years of my life. And it's really helped me to like Jesus more uh, and, and like the Psalms more, like the Gospels more. I've told you this before, but I grew up in such a way that I was, this was my, my folks' fault. This is me. I loved Paul. I loved the logic. I loved the step-by-step. Step. And, and he said what the Gospel is. And why didn't they really say it in the Old Testament? And why didn't Jesus say it? Here he is, God. And, and, uh. And I decided when I was in Japan as a missionary, I'd say, God, I, I want to stop trying to force the Bible into a theological perspective. Let each passage just speak to me. And it's, for me, been a lot more refreshing, a lot more exciting. And what I do now when I see the scripture, I see salvation has always been the same. And here's where I'm coming from. Today, our usual introduction to Christianity is not the same for everybody is what we call the sinner's prayer. Lord, I confess I'm a sinner. I confess I need that cross. Thank you for dying for me. I believe that you love me and forgive me. And, and that's, that's a valid way to enter. In the Old Testament, people entered into a, uh, a salvific relationship with God, often by doing the sacrificial, going through the sacrificial system. God said, do this. Those sacrifices did not save them. The faith of saying, Lord, I'm going to do your will, is what brought them. Uh, it was always by faith. That's what we saw with Abraham. And then when we see Jesus Christ, a lot of times people say, well, that's a transitionary period or whatnot. You know, and yet you still, all through the Bible, you see God's judgment and God holding out the hand of salvation and it requiring a response on our side to grab a hold of that salvation. And so I'm going to talk about what it means to be saved today. Salvation, uh, kind of really in simple terms, 
of just accepting God's will. Uh, it's, it's been said that faith is, is simple. It's agreeing with God about who he says who he is and agreeing with God about who he says we are. Well, God is perfect, holy, and good. He's a God of wrath. He's a God of judgment, but he's also a God of love. And he's a God who died for our sins on the cross. Now, what does he say about us? Well, the Bible says we were created in the image of God. We're not the same as amoebas. We're not the same as dolphins. We're not the same as, as monkeys. Uh, one difference is our, our elite get together and in, in try to discuss how we're the same as animals. And the elite of the orangutans just don't say, you know, I think all animals are the same. And humans are actually very similar to us. It's, we're different. And we talk about that. We think about that. We're made in the image of God. But the Bible also says we're fallen, which means we've fallen from where God made us to be. We're broken. We have sin in our hearts. We have pride. We are willful. We're stubborn when we shouldn't be. We're feisty. We, Norman's giving me the thumbs up. Yeah. We are wretched. Therefore, we need that cross. We need that grace. So believing what God said about himself, uh, believing what he says about us. I would add in, in that it, it, takes, uh, it takes enough faith to, to, uh, to grab a hold of that. It's one thing for somebody to give you a Lamborghini. It's an another thing to take the keys and get in the door and turn on the car. You know, you could say, oh, you've given me a great gift, but if you never drive the car, do you really have it? Uh, here's an illustration before we pray. Let's say that... Uh, you're on the top of this great mountain, and there's a bunch of other people up there, but you're not ready for it, and, and you're not packed. You don't have warm enough clothes, but you're having a party up there. Some of you are just partying, and some of you are striving for personal ambition. I want to be the greatest. I want to get to the top and everything, but the problem is, is you're freezing to death. Now, you got your headphones on, so you're dancing away, and you're trying to ignore the fact that you're freezing to death, and, and you're seeing people succumb to the cold and fall off and die but you try to ignore that as best you can now you hear a trusted person somebody you love and trust uh just below you but there's a, a you're above the clouds there's a cloud bank and says hey buddy sis i'm right down here it's like a six foot fall it's cushiony down here it's i'm just on the other side of the fog there's a cave back here we've got some firewood it's going to be safe. And you say, you know what? I've come to believe that I can trust you. Dance away. 20 minutes later, hey, you, you coming down? Oh, yeah, but I just want to party first. I wish I could do the Doug you're coming there. Yeah, the, uh, and, then, and then somebody else is saying, yeah, I believe there's a safe place down there, but I am determined to get higher than anybody else. You, you know you're going to die up there. Probably so. Will you come down here? Who are you to judge my life? Well, you're turning blue. Crack, 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 crack. Still move my fingers. Having fun up here. See, it's not just enough to believe there's a safe place there. You've got to have enough faith to go there. And there's a lot of people say, yeah, I believe Jesus is God. Yeah, check. I believe he died on the cross. Check. I believe that God's way, yeah, is probably better. I, I say I believe it, but I'm going to go do my thing, do my way. Maybe someday I'll try to do things God's way. Now, if you fall off that cliff, if you say, okay, I'm trusting you, you did not save yourself. The guy who brought you to the safe place saved you. You didn't know. That's not on you. You don't get any credit for that. However, if you just stay up there saying, I believe, I believe, I believe, and you never go to the place, safe place, you're, you're going to freeze to death. And so that's the background, the context, what we're going to be talking about today. I want to accomplish three things. One, if you're not saved yet, get saved. What, what does saved mean, right? What does saved mean? I'm talking about the fact that we are so profoundly broken inside that we're going to spend eternity separated from all things good. Our wickedness, our darkness, our selfishness, our hard-headedness, 
our, our, all this nastiness, and we know it's nasty, and we, we hide it because it's so nasty on the inside. We don't, we don't want to think of ourselves that way. We don't want other people to think of us that way. All of that is so horrible, it's going to pull us away from God. We will be separate from holy God, from everything good and wonderful forever. So when I'm talking about being saved, I mean this nastiness dealt with, forgiven, complete forgiveness, complete acceptance, and eternal life, not eternal death. That's what we're talking about with salvation. So what do I want to accomplish today? One, if you know you're nasty on the inside, if you know you've got struggle with pride, maybe anger issues, maybe greed or lust, or maybe check all of the above, confess it to the Lord. He is good, and he will forgive, and he will take you just as you are. So that's one. One, secondly, I want us to think about salvation properly. And for two reasons. One, so that we don't live our whole life kind of willy-nilly flipping around here and there. And, and secondly, so that we can explain it properly to other people. And uh, thirdly, I want us to learn to talk about it differently. And, and that's, that's, that's where my conviction is. This is, this is we're, we're going away a little bit from this is biblical truth to this is where I think we should be. You're welcome to land in a different spot. Uh, and then, as I always say, we'll get to heaven, and then we'll find out Pastor Dan was right. But anybody who's been here for a while knew that was coming. Uh, no, when we move from areas of uh, absolute clear scripture to places of conviction, we are allowed to disagree on that. We're different Christians are going to come at different places. God's made us all differently. But I, I really think we should talk about salvation differently, and you'll see why as we go. Take some time. Humble yourself before mighty God now. Let's pray. Ask him to work in our hearts. Ask him to work in our church. Ask him to make a difference in our lives. And if you're not saved yet, just get that done right now. Might as well. If you're worried that maybe you're not saved, get that done. Get some confidence in there. I'll tell you what, God doesn't turn away anybody. Do you really want to be saved? Do you, do you love God? Do you want to be with him? I have good news for you. He, is, he will not turn you away. So let's uh, quiet our hearts now and talk with God. Go ahead and pray in the silence of your own heart. Amen. So a huge topic, uh, salvation. And uh, as I was saying, talking about different ways of thinking, there are uh, traditional ways that Christianity has tried to understand and explain Christianity. And I want to warn you. These typical ways, these traditional ways that Christianity has understood salvation are correct. But the lazy way we think about these things is generally not. And I, I want us to not be lazy with just cliches and phraseology. Specifically, Christian, so the way Christians talk about salvation, the way we think about salvation is correct, but we need to be careful. Specifically, Christian culture often takes shortcuts in our language. There's a big theology behind it, but we take a shortcut, and it, sometimes the, the short catchphrases we use aren't really spot on. They're, they're intellectually lazy. They're philosophically not uh, coherent. And, and in our thinking, this can lead us to trouble because we start thinking that our cliches, we start thinking that our shortcuts are gospel truth instead of just tools to help us understand the gospel. You see how that happens? It's a phrase we use all the time. We use all the time. There's, um, there's many of them. 
And, and we start to hold on to those as gospel truth instead of remembering, oh, yeah, this was to help me understand this bigger truth, to unpack this bigger truth. Uh, in other words, uh, because we think, and it often is, when I'm talking with friends, when I'm in a Bible study, it's too co time consuming, it's too cumbersome to lay out this whole comprehensive explanation of what salvation is all the time. We can't do that. Christian culture boils it down into a few catchphrases that are technically true, but can lead us into error. And I realize this is a really confusing start. Hopefully it's going to be uh, cleaned up, cleared up, maybe, possibly as we go along. Uh, some of these phrases are, just ask Jesus into your heart. I know that it's popular right now. It's popular to teach children to do that. And it's also popular for some Christians to say, well, that's incorrect because the Bible never says that. And, and that's true. Uh, the Bible doesn't use that language. Uh, another phrase, you can't save yourself. You can't do anything. God does everything. God does the saving. It's absolutely true. God does the saving. Number three, say the sinner's prayer and you will be saved. You know, I've prayed the sinner's prayer with many people. I still do. Guys, I'm the guy who kind of derides the sinner's prayer sometimes by saying the magic prayer. There's no magic about the prayer. <laughs> Don't You can't just say a magic prayer and get saved. And yet, this path of saying, Lord, I'm a sinner. Lord, please forgive. I do that with people often. And that's appropriate. So see how these things are true, and yet... They can be uh, misleading, especially when we don't think behind them. We get lazy. We just hold on to these cliches, these catchphrases. Uh, and there's many, many others. Uh, uh, baptism can't save you. That's absolutely right. Uh, all true. But just on their own, these things are incomplete. And again, they're potentially misleading. Uh, and I hope we as a church get out of the habit of, uh, of being lazy with our thinking, with the way we speak. I believe that if you ask Jesus into your heart, you will be saved. I believe that. But again, did you know that the phrase, ask Jesus into your heart, is not found in the Bible? Instead of asking Jesus into your heart, we have verses like this. Mark 16, 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. John 1, 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 5, 24, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Isn't this beautiful? So what is it? So I'm not one of those people that gets upset when little kids pray, Jesus, come into my life, come into my heart, because I know what it means. It's a symbol for saying, I want you in my life. I want you at the center of my heart. I want Jesus. I want God. And so I don't get upset when not only little kids, but adults play, please come into my heart. But I think we need to explain. We're not talking. We're not talking about, okay, uh, I want to live my life the way I want. I really don't trust God with my life. I really don't think I have much to apologize for. I live the way my life the way I want to. I am who I want to be. I'm true to myself. But uh, I'll add a little bit of Jesus. Come on into my heart. And uh, maybe a little bit of God insurance. Does anybody think that that's what the Bible means? The, uh, the, the magic prayer, we talk about this checklist. Yeah, I'm a sinner. Yeah, I believe Jesus is historical. The Bible says he died for my sins. Probably he did. The uh, Bible says everybody who believes in him goes to heaven. Yeah, I'd like that. Check. So then I can go to heaven, right? And I could just forget about God for the rest of my life, do my own thing, and it doesn't matter because I've said the magic prayer. It's really true, and we've said this again and again, that faith in God is more like falling in love than baking cookies. It's not step one, step two, step three, check, check, check. Now I'm saved. It's, I love you, God. You are everything to me. I, want, I, fall, I fail, but God, you are so good. 
and I want my life to be about you, and I want to be with your people. And See, it's not based upon our works. It can't be. We're miserable and wretched. Even our righteousness is messed up like filthy rags. And yet, God says, do you trust me? Yeah, then come to me. I don't trust you, but I want to go that way. Do you trust me with your life? Yeah. Trip, trip, fall, fall, wander around, get lost. But do you trust me? Yeah, I'm coming. See the difference? John 14, 21. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me, Jesus said. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them, and I will show myself to them. Wait, 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 wait. This is why we like Paul and not Jesus, because Jesus just says it's works righteousness and you're saved by keeping commands. No, that's not what he said. <laughs> Do you love him? Jesus said, if you love me, obey me. Yeah, Lord, I, I love you, but my love is pathetic compared to your love. And I fall so many times, but I love you, God, and I trust you that your ways are better than my ways. My ways fail. Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Is this saying it's based upon us being perfect? No, it's not. It's based on saying, God, your ways are the right ways. I want to do that. Lord, I trust you with my life. I tr I'm going to build my life on this. I trust you. That's why Foundation Bible Church, a place to build your life, right? Where are you building? Where's, where's a safe habitat for your soul? And it's in the person of Jesus Christ. Not just checklist, checklist, checklist. We're not going to, there's no such thing as cheap God insurance. I say I believe, but I don't really believe because I don't care. No magic prayer. You know the magic prayer is actually idolatrous. It's putting our faith in the prayer instead of in Jesus. Instead of saying, I trust Jesus with everything I have, I'm going to say, I trust the fact that I said that prayer five years ago, and I don't care about God, really, honestly. But I said the prayer, so that's enough. Then Jesus says, uh, anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. So I could say these words are not Pastor Dan's. They belong to Jesus. And Jesus says, you know what? They came right from the Father. In John chapter 6, Jesus is asked a question, and I want to focus on his response. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works that God requires? Isn't that a classic question? And Jesus answered the way 95% of Americans would answer today. You can't do anything. No, that's not what he said. Jesus answered the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. I've heard people argue that we can't tell people to believe in Jesus because that makes it sound like belief is a work and works don't serve, save. Do you know that argument, that debate, that is so prevalent among evangelicals? It's not even in Scripture. Honestly, it's not even a debate that, a, that came to the, thought, the mindset of the early church. We can't ask people to believe because that's a work. Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Let's... We've got so many constructs sometimes that we fail to just accept the word as it is. This is not works righteousness. This is belief in Jesus Christ. Again, this argument is totally alien to Scripture. You're not going to hear that debate. And I want us to just get back to simply reading the Bible and find out that it's always been salvation by faith. Always. Instead, we're told, instead of we can't ask people to believe or belief is a work, instead we're told again and again and again by Jesus, by the prophets, by the apostles to believe in Jesus. Trust him. Trust his way. Choose this day. Follow him. Again and again and again, there is a, a command and there's an expectation of response on our part uh, to show we have faith. You know, if I'm in a, in a, at the bottom of a canyon, I broke my leg, and I'm going to die down there. And somebody drops a little basket over the side and says, get in this, and I'll pull you up. If I don't trust them, I'm not going to get in. If I trust them, then I can be pulled up 
broken leg at all, on the edge of death, and then what a fool I am if I get on the lip of the canyon and do a little happy dance, I save myself. Does that look like saving yourself to anybody? That means I was offered salvation, I took it. And that's the way the Bible speaks about salvation again and again. And remember, when Jesus said the greatest commandment was to love God with everything in us, I wonder, was he just telling us how to be good? Now, here's how you can be a good little Johnny. Here's how you can be a good little uh, Stephen E. Here's how you can be a good little Adam E. Uh, Danny, we got a couple Dannys in here. Uh, how to live, or was Jesus showing us a path to eternal life? Love God. That's what it's at. That's where it's at. Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And just in case you didn't get it, I read a commentary this week that said that means love God with everything you have. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. I'll tell you what, you can go in the gospel and say, I want to see Paul, his outline of salvation. But by the way, we're going to go through the Romans road today. And you won't find it. But if you find somebody who's loving God, not just polished up on the outside, not just doing the religious thing, not just saying the right prayers, not just getting baptized, but in their heart, with their life, they're loving God. I'm in love with God, and I want to learn to love other people. You know what? I don't care if they've got all the right steps or if they went through the Romans road. That person is right with the Lord. God doesn't tear away anybody. See, Jesus wasn't failing to give the gospel when somebody came to him looking for answers. He didn't fail in his mission. And the path to salvation has always been the same. 1 John 3.23 puts it this way, and this is his command, God's command. Well, we're not saved by obeying commands. Okay. Put your question down. Put your statement down. And this is God's command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. I believe Jesus didn't fail. I believe that Jesus was preaching a true gospel and that uh, if all you had was the gospels, you could get right with Jesus and get saved. If you were washed up on a desert island and all you had was the gospels, and you started praying, Lord, I want to love you. I want to I be like you. And Lord, if there was other people, I'd want to love them too. <laughs> You're going to find yourself saved, even if you don't have the beautiful, marvelous theology of Paul to explain it to you. Jesus, as the king, acts. Paul was not the king. He recorded and explained. Jesus acted, and he showed us, uh, in word and in deed, the path uh, to the kingdom, how to get right with God. In the book of Acts, at the very start of the Christian church, and again, I don't think this is a different covenant. I don't think this is a different uh, dispensation. At the very beginning of the Christian church, Peter was preaching this strong message, fierce message, fearless message. He was speaking to a crowd of Jewish people, and he was hammering home the fact that Jesus Christ was crucified, that they were the ones who yelled, crucify, crucify. He's bringing home this strong message. He's not hesitating because he has met the resurrected Jesus Christ. And many of the people became convicted of their sin in their hearts, which is evidence of the Holy Spirit at work, right? They're convicted of their sins. And they cried out to Peter, what should we do? Now, again, and I want us to, I want us to cut out lazy language. Many Christians today would take a lazy shortcut. How would many Christians answer that question today? What should we do? You can't do anything. Salvation depends on God. That's never the way that question is answered in the Bible itself. Did you know that? And I want us to learn not to say things like that because it can be misleading. Listen to the way Peter handles the question, Acts 2.37. When the people heard his message, they were cut to the heart. 
That's a beautiful thing when we're cut to the heart. That's a beautiful thing when we learn to repent. That's a beautiful thing when we step back and say, Lord. They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other disciples, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children, and not just this crowd here, but all who are far off, to all whom the Lord will call, all, in all places, all times, everywhere, I believe. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them. See this? as if the Spirit himself were pleading through us. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Oh, Peter, they can't save themselves. Why do you talk like that? Oh, come off it. He was telling themselves to escape from the danger they're in. We have a way of talking that's not biblical. Save yourselves. Get out of the fire. Get over here. This is where the safety is. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to his number that day. We are so apt to waste our time with these arguments instead of sharing the gospel. Paul and Silas had the exact same question asked to them, this time by Gentiles. So see, not by Jews this time, now it's by Gentiles. So you've got two groups, two schools who would say this is a new dispensation, this is a new covenant now, but we've got the same situation here, same question, and I'm going to be looking at from Acts chapter 16, uh, the crowd joined in attack against Paul and Silas because they were preaching about Jesus Christ. Nothing is punished like a good deed, right? And, and Paul had, went through so much hardship and beating because he talked about Jesus Christ when it wasn't popular. Brothers and sisters, have you ever been stoned and left for dead with heavy rocks because you spoke about Jesus? Well, that's not going to happen very often in our part of the world. It does happen in other parts of the world. But have you ever not talked about Jesus because some people thought you were cool and they might think you're not quite as cool because they know you're in love with Jesus Christ and you just can't help but talk about him? What about friends and family who tell you, we're sick every Thanksgiving you've got to pray. We're sick every Christmas you try to tell us about the gospel. Paul and Silas, I'll tell you what, they could get run out of town in less than two weeks, but they could also start a church and appoint elders <laughs> in that time. So Paul and Silas uh, were attacked by a crowd, and the magistrates er ordered them. So you're attacked by a crowd, right? Here come the police, the popo. So now, now, now there's going to be justice. They're going to help me, right? They come and they strip Paul and Silas, which is embarrassing. Some would say embarrassing. <laughs> they, they, they were stripped. This is horrible. They were beaten with rods. Beaten. Why? Because they were talking about Jesus. They, they loved people, and they were attacked by nasty people. After they had been severely flogged, and the Bible doesn't play with extra words. It doesn't toss severely in there. This is the same guy who has been beaten, shipwrecked, this was a severe beating. This is a flogging. They were thrown into jail. How do you feel when life isn't fair? Well, how, well, how do you feel when you do something? How about when you do something bad and you think the fun punishment doesn't fit the crime? This is totally unjust. There's no justice here. This is not fair. Why am I suffering? Other people do the same thing. Did you do it? Yeah, but Paul actually did nothing wrong. He was good, and now he's been stripped in front of people. He's been attacked by an angry mob. The police, the ones who should bring justice, have beat him severely, and they throw him in jail. The, co the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully, and in that culture, if they escaped, the jailer had to pay for it with his life. When he received his orders, he put them in the inner cell, <coughs> and he put their feet in stocks. The Bible says next that Paul and Silas practically lost their faith, they spent the whole evening ticked off, cursing, and angry. Uh, they got in a fight. They could hardly stand to look at each other. Paul, this is all your fault. Uh, oh, wait, I've got a different, tra different translation. Sorry about that. 
Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. What stops you from praying? What stops me from wanting to sing praises to God? They were singing and praying, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Because you don't need the Holy Spirit to pout. You don't need the Holy Spirit to feel ill-used. But something special was going on in their lives, and people were drawn to that. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundation of the prison was shaken. And I would say all the prisons that we're in today, the prisons of selfishness and self-righteousness and self-centeredness, can be shaken to the core when Jesus Christ comes to town. At once, all the prison doors flew open because that's what Jesus does. And everyone's chains came loose because that's what Jesus does. And the jailer woke up, and when he saw all the prison doors open, he drew his sword, and he was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. Because Paul and Silas were willing to live a godly life, they had authority to speak into the lives of these other prisoners, and they listened when Paul says, no, we're guilty. Stay here. Well, Paul wasn't guilty. No, you guys are guilty. Stay here. The jailer called for some lights, not just flip a light. Somebody get some lamps. Somebody light some lights. He rushed in, and he fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He realized there was something supernatural going on here. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, again, I think many modern Christians would answer, that's the beauty of it. You can't do anything, and if you do try to do something, you ruin it. Even belief is an action, so don't try to believe. If God grants it to you to believe, then you will. If he doesn't, then you won't. Well, that's, there's a theology behind that, but that's never what's said in Scripture. There are a couple problems with giving that response. The first, again, that's an interpretation of Scripture, and there are many wise people that went to Moody and Dallas that would say differently. There are many wise people that are followers of Calvin that would say differently than the, Mo the followers of Dallas Theo. In other words, there's sharp people that are coming down on different sides of this. Good people, wise Christian people. That's an interpretation of Scripture. And when somebody's asking how to be saved, that's not the right time. We can have fun talking about these things. But that's not the right time. How can I be saved should not be answered by, you can't do anything, don't worry about it. The second problem with answering someone like this is that no one in Scripture, again, ever talks like that. Again, watch how Paul and Silas answer the question, what must I do to be saved? They replied, you believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your whole household, this is for everybody. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in the house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his whole household were baptized because baptism is not a standard, a, a stamp of approval saying you've arrived at a Christian. Baptism is what Christians do. Christ gave the example, and when we follow Christ, we follow Christ into baptism. It's a symbol of going from, from, from the old life to the new. The water is, is like being buried in the ground. We resurrect to a new life through the power of Jesus Christ. The water does not save, but it's an act of faith saying, I'm going to do things God's way. I'm a Christian now. What do I do? I get baptized. The jailer brought them uh, into his house and set a meal before them, and he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. And I don't want to be a mopey, pouty Christian because if I've come to believe in God, if I know eternity in heaven is waiting for me and the new earth, if I know I'm accepted in all my messed upness, is that a real word? <laughs> I'm No, but, but you knew what I meant. <laughs> I'm accepted just as I am. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I want to live a life of rejoicing. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, and so should I, and so should you. He and his whole household, and don't you want a family filled with joy? Changing your life can't save you, but trusting Jesus will result in a changed life. Works can't save you, but if you love Jesus, you're going to want to work for him. The sinner's prayer has been used by millions of people to get right with God, 
but the prayer can't save you. In fact, trusting the prayer can be like idolatry. It can be another religious act. We can polish up the cup on the outside but not clean the inside. If we don't love God and if we aren't learning to trust him, the act of going through the rote prayer means nothing. Ezekiel 18.32 says, For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God, so turn and live. 1 John 5.13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life because it doesn't depend on your works. It depends on holding on and trusting God. So the worry might be, and I know the worry, and I can't help you with some of it because this is the way the Bible teaches it. But the worry might be, do I believe enough? What if I don't love God enough or trust him enough? The good news is God is a God of grace, and he calls us to perfection, okay? This is weird. Jesus Christ speaks of only having faith like a mustard seed, calling us to perfection and saying, you need a little bit of faith. We see people declared saved in the New Testament who had just believed. They weren't saved after 10 years of church. The Ethiopian eunuch believed and was saved and he was baptized. The, 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 uh, the jailer we just saw about believed, saved, baptized, he didn't have to have a lot of theology. He didn't have to be some expert philosopher. He didn't have to be brilliant. He, had, he didn't have to learn and do a whole bunch of good deeds. He believed and he was saved. It's not something we earn by great effort. We can't earn it. In the Old Testament, we see that Abraham was declared righteous because he trusted in God. And right after that, after that, is when we have this whole thing with Ishmael. Right after that, he begins to doubt, and he tries to fulfill God's will, his way. I thank God for a God of grace who said, Abraham, he's right with me, and already knew all the ways Abraham would stumble after that. Joel 2.32, Acts 2.21, Romans 10.13, all tell us that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Just call out, just turn to him. Brothers and sisters, today, do you want to be saved? Call out to Jesus. Trust him. Are you, are you worried, maybe I'm not really saved? I want to ask you a question. Do you want to be? Because he doesn't turn folks away. Call out to Jesus. Trust Jesus. You will not be disappointed. Uh, you know what? I did my sermon out of order. Let's <laughs> start over. Turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, 25 through 37. You know, if I was smart, I would have just smoothly transitioned without telling you I got, got, got rolling there. And Luke chapter 10. <coughs> On one occasion, and uh, I guess... I, I read that the Greek here doesn't mean that this happened chronologically next. It's, such, it's just saying, like, and then this thing happened, or this great thing also happened. On one occasion, expert in the law, so a lawyer, he, he really understood the Old Testament, stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And this is the kind of question that for most of my life, up until my 30s, disappointed me about Jesus. Jesus, you know the answer. It's by faith. Just trust, believe. You don't have to do anything. And Jesus never does that. But I've come to understand that he's actually showing what faith looks like. What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? And the lawyer said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. And again, for years I tried to, try to say, well, Jesus technically understands that nobody can do this, so he's showing his incompleteness so that uh, years later when Paul comes on the scene, he could understand salvation. And that always felt a little empty inside because I thought, why didn't Jesus just deal with the situation when he was there? 
He's not saying if you're perfect, you'll be saved. He's saying, do you love God? Are you listening to him? Are you learning to love other people? That's what faith in me looks like. That's what trust in me looks like. But he wanted to justify himself because why? He's human, and humans are twerps. i got to justify myself, right? i got to justify myself. Not when we have a God of grace. We can come clean because we have a God of grace. Stop justifying all the nastiness. I don't have to justify struggling with pride. I can say that's a sin, and I know it. Don't justify it anymore. But this fellow wanted to justify his sin, so he asked Jesus, well... Who's my neighbor? Gotcha. He didn't know he was dealing with, did he? <laughs> Who's my neighbor? Isn't that funny? That's legalism. Okay, I'll obey the rule, but how much do I have to do? What's the minimum? Jesus says, where's your heart? Are you loving God? Then you won't even ask that question. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, well, then, who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said to him, you know what? A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, went on their way, leaving him for dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And I, again, I, I read a commentary that said this happened to be is almost better translated, luckily. It was supposed to be good fortune. And by chance, wonderfully, a priest happened to be going down the same road. And then the disappointment. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side of the road. Well, isn't that disappointing? A priest. Priests are religious, right? They're always talking about God, right? They're doing the prayer thing, right? Well, he wasn't right with God, though, in his heart, was he? priest happened to be coming by down the same road when he saw the man he passed by on the other side so to a levite well maybe the priesthood has failed at times but the levites have remained true at certain times in the old testament when the priest didn't so a levite when he came to the place and saw him also passed by on the other side uh when we talk about samaritans the the samaritan people were Mixed racially, they weren't pure Jewish. Uh, their capital was Samaria, the north of Jerusalem. They had, in many ways, held on to some aspects of the Old Testament, but mixed in other religious ideas. Uh, they did not understand. They didn't go to the temple to sacrifice. They were, they were, they were, some ways closer than outright paganism, but, but very different. And they despised the Jewish people. The Jewish people despised them. Even though they lived in close proximity, they didn't want to have anything to do with one another. It's very similar to the difference between Americans and Canadians today. Just joking if you're on the Internet and you happen to see that. But we have these lines that divide people today. Uh, Trekkies, Star Wars people, I'm, that's, I'm being humorous. We have racial lines. Uh, I was reading about some friends in India who say the caste system is still in in order there, and people suffer because of it. Uh, uh, we don't like people because they're Asian or they're people from the Middle East or whatnot. We have these things that divide us. We divide each other based on these people dress this way, these people dress that way. And, and all of it is just sin so that we can divide ourselves and look down at other people. And so we had this severe racial, racial, not racial, sorry, Rachel, racial animosity between uh, Samaritans and Jews. And uh, so this fellow's beaten up. He's left on the side of the road. His own people walk right past him. They don't want to help. But a Samaritan, and Jesus is intentionally, I mean, that's offensive, and he's offending their sensibilities because he's trying to shake them up. He's trying to shake them up. He's trying to teach them something about the kingdom of God. But a Samaritan, As he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out 
two coins to denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after this man. I have business to do, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. Now, Jesus said, yeah, who is my neighbor? Then you put Jesus in a tight spot. Now, Jesus says, which of these, thi- which of these do you think? think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers. The expert of the law replied, well, um, uh, the one who had mercy on him, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Do you know, please listen, the sinner's prayer, which I do with people, can be legalism. When we think, well, what do I have to do? Say the prayer, okay, check, I'm saved. Jesus says, they do a lot of, God said, they've got a lot of sacrifices, but their hearts are far from me, and their offerings stink to me. The sinner's prayer, without a heart to go along with it, without loving God, just the way Jesus said, doesn't get you anywhere. It can be deceptive. You see why I'm making a big deal about this today? I want us to understand salvation. I want us to be able to explain salvation to other people. And I I want us to be careful not to be lazy with the way we talk because even if we've got it rock solid, it can be confusing to other people, and I know this for a fact. What must I do to be, how do I get right with God? How do I get saved? You can't do anything. Don't say that. You can't do anything. Said no person in the Bible ever. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to put your faith in God. You're going to learn to love him. With the Let's do it that way. All right, Romans Road, real quick. I'm going to lead you through the path of salvation. And again, Jesus Christ showed us because he was the actor. He was the king. Paul is the one who recorded and explained the actions of the king. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Do you know that? Do you, do you know that you're a sinner? In your heart. And if, if you're fine with this, start praying for the other people in here. Start praying for the people who watch this on television. Start praying for the people who might see it on, on the Internet, okay? Do you know you're a sinner? Do you know you struggle with nastiness, hard-headedness, you, ooh, this rage inside of you, this, this judgmentalism, lust, I want, I need, I've got to have, greedy all the time, never satisfied, dissatisfied, upset, pouty. You know what that's called? That's called sin. Because it's a p- that which is opposed to the will of God is sin. And if you know there's darkness, you, have, you also know there's such a thing as goodness. And God is perfect and holy. And the Bible says, God's perfect standard, we've all come short. Everybody. Me, you, the Pope, everybody. Everybody. So here's where we start. You want to be saved? You want to get right with God? <coughs> Look down deep inside. And you say, I'm messed up. I want to be forgiven. Romans 5.1, therefore, since we've been justified, justified means made right, God's approved of us, by faith, we have peace with God. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's how we, here's how we get peace with God. We put our faith in Christ. Romans 5.8, but God shows us his love for us. And that, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You mean when I was partying and I didn't care about God? You mean when I was living my life just for my business and I didn't care about God? You mean when I was ruining my family and treating my wife like crap and and, and not caring about my kids? God loved me even then. When I was ruining my life with alcohol and drugs? When I was just filled up with anger all the time and I was a difficult person to believe, be around? You mean God cared about me then? God shows his love for us that when we were still enemies of God, when we didn't give a hoot about him, when we were fighting with God, we were trying to keep him away, Jesus died for you. He died for every nasty thing inside of us. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. What's a wage? It's what you earn for what you do. You go to you go to work at Target, they give you a wage. You go to you go to work at, at the car dealership, they give you a wage. The wages of living a sinful life, the Bible says, is death. Sin, 
brings death of love, death of relationships. Sin brings death of hope. Sin brings death of peace. Sin brings death of joy. But ultimately, what we're talking about here is sin brings eternal death because of our sins, those dark, nasty things I talked about. We have separation from perfect God, and we will be separate from, from, from all things good and beautiful and wonderful forever. Forever. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's a present. You can't earn it. What we earn is death. What you get for free by grabbing a hold of that is eternal life. We don't go to God and say, give me what I deserve. We go to God and say, thank you, God, for giving me what I don't deserve. Thank you for taking me just as I am. Thank you for accepting me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for giving me eternal life. Thank you for the promise that I'm not going to be always this messed up, but you're going to make me a better person. Romans 10, 9, because if you confess with your mouth, and here's how we get this sinner's prayer, which, again, is a good prayer. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart. God raised him from the dead. He didn't stay dead. I, I'm a sinner, but he died for me. And by faith in him, I believe that he'll give me eternal life. And guess what? He already rose from the dead, which means, boom, you can too. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It didn't say about half the folks. It didn't say about 75% of the people. Everyone who calls out to Jesus, he's going to save them. Well, I want our church to all be saved. And I want us, when we talk about this, talk about it in a way that people can understand, talk about it biblically. And I hope that... Uh, we think about salvation properly. I hope we speak about salvation properly. I hope we share this message everywhere we go. Jesus Christ was willing to die so that people could go to heaven. Let's live our lives to gather up more folks and bring them into the kingdom of God. And let's be ambassadors of Jesus Christ in our lives. So now, we've just explained salvation. Let's go out there and share this message with everyone we can. Amen? Amen. Dear God, you're good, you're wonderful, you're perfect. Help us to be more like you, and help us to love people the way you do. We want to love you with everything we've got inside, Lord. Thank you, Father, for being just who you are. Praise your name. Amen. Thank you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.